Okay, so we're finally on to arthroplasty, which is really the last component of Unit 8. Um, and really, we're going to focus on total hip replacement and total knee replacement. But just a few general words about what arthroplasty is. It is a surgical removal of a diseased joint and then replacement with synthetic materials. Um, and those materials might be uh, stainless steel, titanium, plastic, polyethylene, um, but there are a number of um, shapes and materials that are used to make the uh, new joint. Um, now you can have a partial joint replacement called a hemiarthroplasty, or you can have a total arthroplasty, and that is what is most commonly seen. Um, the new joint replacements last a lot longer than the old ones, so you see some younger patients having surgeries to replace hips and knees. People used to be told, like, you really should wait because the device only lasts so long. Um, really now you can do it on younger patients and their recovery time is a lot less than it used to be. There are different techniques you can use um, with arthroplasty. There are the cemented techniques that use um, a special cement. And then there are some that are non-cemented that rely on the bone growing into the prosthesis. Um, and we'll maybe talk a little bit about those uh, with the hip replacements. Um, the reason, the main reason that we um, do a hip replacement or a knee replacement is because that person's in pain and there's some disability. So if we replace the joint with a prosthesis, we can reduce their pain and restore function and mobility. And really, you see people who have lived with arthritis for years. They get that new hip or that new knee, and suddenly they can do things that they couldn't do um, for years. So that is the reason that we do that. Now let's move these down. These are a lot of the conditions that we um, associate with needing a joint replacement. Osteoarthritis, obviously that and rheumatoid arthritis, whenever you have degeneration of the joint surfaces, they break down, you get those bone spurs, um, you've lost uh, mobility, your uh, patient's in a lot of pain, you replace that joint and now um, you don't have the changes to the cartilage, and it's certainly not going to wear out or degenerate at the rate that um, an arthritic joint will. Septic joint is a condition. Um, it's similar to osteomyelitis in that you have um, like an infectious process, and that joint becomes avascular, and it needs to be replaced. Um, femoral neck fractures is another common indication for total hip arthroplasty. Um, that break at the neck, um, very uh, risky to do the intermedullary nail or other procedures sometimes um, if you're concerned about the patient um, not being able to recover from that and often they will do a replacement surgery with that. It sort of depends on where the break is. When it's inside the trochanter, the intertrochanteric fracture, they will a lot of times try that internal fixation. But if it's right at the neck, um, that's sort of a bad place to have a fracture. It's a very unstable place. And so what they normally do is replace um, the joint. Um, avascular necrosis is another one. And I think we kind of covered that. Um, sometimes that can happen when you dislocate a joint and those surfaces, um, you know, the blood vessels are compressed, the blood supply is compromised, and because the blood flow doesn't get to the joint, it gets necrotic. Um, some other conditions can cause that, but mostly when you have a lack of blood supply to the joint, that joint gets necrotic and it often needs to be replaced. Um, trauma, um, again, we're talking about mostly fractures or um, maybe a direct knee injury um, where it is better for that patient to have a joint replacement. Um, than to have a lengthy recovery with uh, other orthopedic surgeries that may not work. Um, and developmental or abnormalities, and by that, a lot of times we're talking about um, like the congenital hip dysplasia that doesn't respond to more conservative measures. Um, leg calves, Perth disease, um, things like that. Um, and I don't want you to get too tied up in the developmental abnormalities. It's sort of more of a peds thing. You'll see it more um, in you know younger populations. Um, and along with all of these conditions, sometimes a joint replacement is done when other um, surgeries, other treatments have been ineffective, and that patient is just in so much pain and um, having so much trouble with their activities of daily living that 
uh, the benefit of the surgery outweighs the risk to the patient. So just generally speaking, there are some complications that are associated with all arthroplasty, all major arthroplasty surgery. Um, we worry about infection. And I think we've talked enough about osteomyelitis. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about septic joint, but we worry about infection um, with orthopedic surgeries of all kinds. So we want to monitor for signs and symptoms. We want to do whatever we can to maintain asepsis um, and prevent infection and teach the patient. Um, to monitor for signs and symptoms of infection. Remember, a lot of these orthopedic cases are out the door in two or three days at the most. Some of them are out like almost the next day. Um, and we've seen that on 2A a lot. Um, those of you who have been with me on 2A know that these patients come in, they have their surgery, they're in a lot of pain post-op day one, PT gets them up, and the next day they're placed either in a rehab or back to their um, homes. It depends on how much support they have and how much uh, recovery time is anticipated. So infection is definitely one of the things we worry about um, with any joint replacement. Um, deep vein thrombosis. I know this isn't a hematology chapter where you're worried about the clotting cascade or anything like that um, or coagulopathies, but deep Deep vein thrombosis, or DVT, is so common with any of these orthopedic procedures. Um, you know, you have the injury, there's some injury or inflammation present, and then you combine that with a lack of mobility and, uh, you know, a lack of venous return, and you really have a problem um, waiting to happen. So DVT prophylaxis is going to be a big focus of any um, arthroplasty. Um, it comes up in the other surgeries, too, with your internal fixation after a fracture. It comes up with um, lower leg fractures um, or fractures of femur. But certainly with um, hip replacement, knee replacement, we really worry about uh, DVT. And um, we watch for signs and symptoms of that and signs and symptoms of a PE. If, a D if we don't get the DVT um, and that patient becomes short of breath, it still may have happened and now you're looking at um, a PE. So that is another complication um, that you might want to think of. And the other main concern that we're going to worry about with um, any kind of joint replacement is pain control. So if you're going to make a care plan for somebody with a joint replacement who was inpatient, these would probably be the three things that would um, sort of absorb your focus. Now, in addition to that, you know, there are other things that you might want to look at. The mobility issue, for one thing. Um, and you also want to look at um, how that person can function. And usually PT will make sure that they can at least walk with assistive devices. I'm going to show you some videos, probably in class, um, about people getting up post-op day one. There are some really good videos of how it looks. I mean, people really do need early ambulation. That helps with pain management, it helps with mobility, and it helps with um, DVT um, prophylaxis. So... Um, I'm going to put into that block um, promotion of early mobility. Okay, so I think that's pretty much an overview of joint replacement in general, and then we'll go into hip and knee respectively. Okay, so we're moving on to total hip arthroplasty, um, and this is kind of what it looks like when it's all done. Um, showing you the prosthetic device, you have the um, metal um, spike, and um, it's kind of interesting how they do it. They actually take the femur out, um, they kind of hack off the head of it, and then they put this spike inside um, the femur, and that kind of grows in there. And then this ball can actually be made out of a number of materials, and it's sort of um, selected by the surgeon based on um, what the patient's... Uh, individual needs are and what the surgeon has had experiences with. And then the acetabulum, that socket, is also replaced. Um, and here you see the one, um, this is made out of like a metal, let's see, let me get that, right here. Um, you have that metal, that's why it's not showing up, I have white, um, metal socket that fits inside the acetabulum. So the cartilage in that socket part of the ball and socket joint is re is removed. And then this um, metal part um, is placed in there. And then there's like this plastic cup, and that gives it a nice smooth gliding surface. And remember that the um, hip joint is a ball and socket joint. It needs to move in all of the different planes of um, motion. It has to have circumduction, flexion, extension, 
Um, and so you really need to have a smooth surface. Now, not all joint replacements are going to use a metal um, acetabular or component. Um, sometimes there will be um, a polyethylene um, or some other type of plastic. Um, but the idea is that you want something that's going to be durable and something that's going to give you maximum uh, movement, um, range of motion. So that is sort of how the prosthesis fits in. And you can see, well, let me see if I can kind of circle that there. That's exactly how that spike fits in. And then there's a neck that's similar to the femoral neck. Now for the patient who has um, high risk of fractures because of osteoporosis or osteomalacia, um, really that vulnerable part, that femoral head, um, now that it's made out of titanium or stainless steel or whatever the um, prosthesis is, um, it's sort of a, you know, sort of an indestructible thing. Now that doesn't mean um, that a joint replacement never has to be um, replaced or that it never fails. Um, but it's certainly a better solution than um, allowing that person to um, continue with a diseased joint or um, a fracture that's unlikely to heal even with internal fixation. So let me get rid of that. So preoperatively for a hip replacement, um, there are some important things we need to remember. Um, when we talked about osteomyelitis, we really brought this up, but you want to time surgery when the patient is optimally healthy. And that means that if they've had a UTI or they've had a respiratory infection or they've had strep throat or any other infection, we want to postpone that surgery until the patient is well um, because we don't want to put them at risk for osteomyelitis. Um, you know, when you have a weakened spot, any of that bacteria um, can sort of colonize in that area and create a problem. Um, and the immune system, if it's already fighting off one thing, you don't really want to give it um, a new... Um, invasive portal of entry um, to have to defend. Um, we want to make sure that they're not anemic. Their H&H &H should be within normal limits. And you want to make sure that they're not um, having serious comorbid conditions, kidney failure, renal failure, all of those things, diabetes. They should really be well controlled before you schedule surgery. Um, so lab values that we're going to watch, I'm going to switch colors, keep them guessing. Okay. There we go. Um, we want to look at their CBC. Okay, obviously, if you're worried about anemia, you're going to watch their um, hemoglobin, their hematocrit. If you're worried about infection, you're going to look at a white count. Um, and if you're worried about any blood clotting disorders um, or bleeding, because some of these orthopedic surgeries can um, cause a lot of blood loss, you're going to look at platelets. So that's what your CBC is for. Another thing that you might look at um, is a chest x-ray to rule out any kind of pneumonia. Um, even though it seems unrelated to the orthopedic procedure, um, you really want to make sure that there's no pulmonary complications. Remember that people who undergo major surgical procedures um, are at risk for developing pneumonia postoperatively um, from the anesthetic and also from the lack of mobility, and they're prone to developing atelectasis, which is a condition um, that's also caused by uh, failure to expand the lungs fully. So a chest x-ray will rule out anything underlying that's going to make that recovery more complicated or more difficult. And it will also tell you if you have any kind of pneumonia going on. Um, another thing that you might want to do is an EKG or an ECG, whatever. Um, and really you just want to make sure that there's no uh, dysrhythmias that might conflict with um, surgery, make it more difficult for that patient to recover, or make it a riskier procedure. Okay, so, and you would also want to be concerned if the patient had poor circulation to the extremities, or the extremity that you're going to operate on. Um, so that would also be something that you might want to look into before you do an elective procedure. Now sometimes you might not be able to really um, postpone a procedure. For example, when someone has a pelvic fracture and you need to replace um, the acetabulum or when somebody has a fracture of the femoral neck and you have to do a hip replacement. Um, a septic joint would be another example or avascular necrosis. When something is more or less urgent, um, you might not have the luxury of waiting until their um, anemia is completely resolved. However, you can give a medication. I'll just put this out there. I don't, it's definitely not going to be on your exam three. 
Um, but it was something I came across. And it's not going to be on the final either. Um, Epoeaton uh, Alpha. I'm not even sure. Let me just make sure that I'm spelling that correctly. Um, yep, I'm not. There we go. Um, also known as Epigen. And I'll put that in there. You don't really have to write this down. Um, it's good. It's good information to have and to know. Um, but this is something that can get an H and H up quickly, um, if need be. Um, so it's just something that a surgeon might do if they're concerned about a patient's status prior to surgery and they don't have the time to wait um, until the patient's anemia is well controlled. So your pre-op education to people, um, education is really an important part. Let me hold on a sec. There we go. Um, um, you want to teach them about their post-op course. Um, you want to teach them about the incentive spirometer. You're going to teach them about um, ambulation and the need, why it's so important to get out of bed. And usually that's going to happen about 24 hours after their surgery is complete. Let me open that up a little bit. Um, you're also going to teach them about pain, what to expect and how to control it. So we'll just pay, say pain control options. Um, and that um, is sort of something that should happen. Obviously, most people schedule their hip replacements or their knee replacements um, with their surgeon, and hopefully some of this education is happening in the office. But um, even if not, if you are the nurse who is assigned to this patient in the hospital, um, let's say you're in pre-admission, you can, you can really review these things very quickly um, with the patient. Get the incentive spirometer out and show them, because once they're a little bit groggy from anesthesia, um, you have fewer teachable moments with that person. Um, so you might not have to go through the entire post-op regime, but you definitely at least want to get them through the immediate post-op period when they're maybe not as um, educable as they are before their surgery. And there are some other things that you do want to teach this person. Um, Prior to their surgery, you want to maybe talk to them about autologous blood collection or blood donation um, because some of these surgeries um, carry a pretty big risk of bleeding. Um, sometimes your loss could be as many as 1,500 mLs. Um, they might want to bank some of their own blood um, in preparation for the surgery. Um, I know we're trying to build up their H&H, &H, but at the same time, they should have um, blood available. Um, some doctors use the cell saver technology, and always they're going to, if the patient's not a Jehovah's Witness, they're going to get a consent for packed red cell or blood products, um, and hopefully they won't need them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the actual procedure itself and things that they do to control bleeding, um, and they usually can get some good hemostasis. We're going to teach them to um, prevent infection by showering the night before. We're usually going to get them um, special wipes that are impregnated with antibacterial um, cleanser. And then they might have to use the wipes the day of. Um, and that's kind of important. Um, get that skin as clean as possible. And of course you're going to tell them that they need to wear clean clothes into the hospital um, so that they don't contaminate what they just um, scrubbed in their shower and in their morning wipe. Um, you're going to make sure that you have um, your allergies documented um, and that you know you're going to clarify with the surgeon about what medications they're allowed to take. They should be really NPO prior to this procedure. I'll just put that if I can. Here we go. Okay, so all our education is down here. So they're going to be NPO except for meds as directed by their surgeon. And they might have to take their antihypertensive meds or their diabetes meds with sips of water. Um, so all of those things should be covered in their preoperative education. Okay, so it's time to um, talk about the intraoperative phase of total hip replacement. 
And um, the first thing on the list you'll notice is the skip protocol. Now sometimes the circulating nurse is responsible for making sure the patient has their antibiotic or the nurse that's in the holding room in the OR, um, but often it will be the anesthesiologist who administers the um, initial antibiotic. Um, surgical Care Improvement Project is what those initials stand for, by the way. It's a joint commission initiative um, that is aimed at reducing the number of surgical complications, including infection. Um, so the SKIP protocol is usually ANSEF within an hour of um, incision time, although many docs will like it about 15 minutes prior in case there's any unexpected delay. Um, I have had the situation where we've given the antibiotic and then something delays the procedure, Either anesthesia is called away for something more emergent or um, there's difficulty getting the anesthesia in. Um, you were trying for a spinal and several tries later you can't get it, so you go to general. Um, there might be reasons where the antibiotic goes in 15 minutes before you think you're going to have incision time. And then before you know it, you're outside of that hour. Um, so um, a lot of docs do prefer it within 15 minutes um, of incision time or of anticipated incision time, just to make sure that they're within that hour. Um, usually the agent that they use is ANSEF, it, you know, if they're not allergic to it, um, or allergic to penicillins, because ANSEF is a cephalosporin. Um, but it can be other agents as determined by the doctor. Um, now for anesthesia, what we're normally looking at um, it could be spinal or it could be epidural, and these things actually reduce the, um, these types of anesthesia reduce the likelihood of complications. Um, general anesthesia is sometimes used, and that sort of depends on whether um, the anesthesia can get a spinal on people or an epidural, um, whether they can sit for it. There's a certain way you have to um, sit to get the spinal, um, and other things, their blood pressure, things like that. Um, but spinals and epidurals are actually great for the patient. They could be sedated, but they might be awake. So you reduce a lot of the complications that you might have with a general anesthetic. Um, and then after the patient is um, well anesthetized and they've tested the level of anesthesia, um, that's when they go in and they remove the um, disease joint and replace it. Um, I was reading some interesting things about that. Sometimes the metal is cobalt, um, it, you know, but that is when that happens. Now, the cemented procedures are the, you know, sort of the older procedures, and there is a special, like, epoxy that's used um, to cement those uh, prosthetic pieces into place. Um, and the advantage to a cemented, you do have earlier weight bearing um, than with non-cemented, but, you know... There are more chances that things can go wrong with the cemented. It's not as stable. Non-cemented um, allows you to sort of fix that prosthesis in place, and then the bone actually holds it in. The bone grows around it and in such a way that it holds that prosthetic in. Um, and those are considered more durable, um, less likely to get uh, to, to have complications like dislocation. Um, but they do take longer. Um, because it takes longer for the bone to um, recover that way. Um, so weight bearing, full weight bearing might be delayed a little bit. Even though we want to get these patients out of bed, you may need to have that person in a walker um, or really a lot less weight bearing for a little while. Um, they may have extended rehab, maybe two to three weeks. Okay, so now we're talking about post-op care after a hip replacement. <clears throat> And um, your post-op care is where I'm going to focus most of um, our time on this. It needn't take long because I think we really have covered a lot of this stuff um, in other parts of the presentation, and you've had it as part of your perioperative care. But things that are really particular to hip um, arthroplasty. Um, preventing DVTs and PE, I did star that. Um, it's a major complication, particularly with um, the older adult. Um, and so to that end, there are a few things that we normally do. Um, I want to make that font a little bit smaller, though, so I don't run out of room. Okay, <clears throat> the big thing that we're going to do is SCDs. Um, sometimes you see TEDs, but really more the SCDs um, to prevent the uh, venous stasis. Uh, Lovenox or heparin. 
but some kind of anticoagulant therapy, definitely. I mean, if the patient was already on Coumadin or whatever, um, I've seen other agents used. But generally speaking, most of these patients are going to get some Lovenox or heparin. And that's one of those things that I kind of question when I see a patient who's had a major um, hip replacement and their platelets are in normal range and they're not getting a Lovenox or heparin injection. The biggest thing by far, and you're going to remember this because um, I'm going to put it in caps. And this is true for knee surgery as well. Early ambulation. You need to get that person out of the bed and moving. Um, and get that blood moving. Now, they may not be fully weight-bearing, and you might need PT to assist you here, but they should be out of bed on post-op day one. Okay, um, and they shouldn't be afraid of that. We want to medicate them for pain so that it's easier to ambulate, but generally, you really want to get them out of bed. That's going to be your major um, prophylaxis against DVT. But you're also going to see the C, uh, SCDs, Lovenox, heparin, um, anything you can do to prevent DVT because um, Joint Commission has really stated that if you have elective surgery, you really should not uh, have a PE or any kind of venous thromboembolic event. Um, and PE can be deadly within an hour. So typically what you'll have is a patient who doesn't want to move and nobody makes them move and um, they've had this procedure to their one of their lower extremities, whether it's the hip or the knee. And maybe they're a little older and, um, you know, they don't have the same uh, venous return that they might have had. We can't really elevate their leg too much. Um, in the sideline position you can, but you don't want to flex the hip um, too much. So um, you have a person who's laying in bed, who's not moving, who's now maybe a little hypercoagulable because um, post-operatively a lot of people are, and they have some kind of injury to their, you know, or some, you know, interruption of the normal flow of events in their hip or in their knee, and they are very, very, very prone to DVTs, and DVTs turn into PEs very quickly. Um, remember the signs and symptoms of a DVT, and that's going to be your redness, heat, warmth, swelling unilaterally, only one leg, um, and it's painful. Um, Homan sign, again, you know, you'll see some references maybe refer to it. I only shout it out because if you have an ATI question or an NCLEX question on Homan sign, you should know what it is. It's that dorsiflexing of the foot. You get pain when that when you elicit that. Um, however, it's no longer the standard of care. It's really the redness, heat, warmth and um, pain that the person experiences. You might even feel what's called a palpable cord in the back of the calf. Um, and then that can progress if they start complaining of calf pain, you know, very quickly if that uh, thrombus decides to embolize and lodge in their lung, um, now you've got a life-threatening event, um, pulmonary edema, um, and this is going to be you know, something that could really hurt this person who came in basically for an elective procedure that was to reduce pain and give them a better quality of life. Um, so prevention of DVT and PE has been sort of a running theme in musculoskeletal, but it is particularly important in the older patient who is getting a total hip replacement or a total knee replacement. Um, so just kind of remember that. And I hope, you know, it's kind of getting boring because that means that you're putting it together like peanut butter and jelly orthopedic surgery and DVT. So, okay. Um, let me see if I can leave that up really, really tiny over here in case people are still writing. And the other complication, and this is <clears throat> the big thing that you want to remember is that the hip replacement early out in the first several days postoperatively can be dislocated. Um, and really what we do here, I know way back when we were doing the labs on um, transfer and bed making and positioning and all that stuff, um, I got out a wedge pillow, one of those um, abductor pillows. And let me see if I have a picture of it here. I think I do. Um, yep, yeah, I do. Okay, here it is. That is your abductor pillow. Um, and I know those uh, folks who've been on 2A with me have seen patients who've had these. Um, and it's very important. It keeps those legs in an abducted position. You do not want them to roll inward. You do not want them to adduct um, because that can lead to displacement of the prosthesis. In fact, for the first four months postoperatively, 
um, you have a higher risk. So we're going to do some um, education with these folks. I have some more pictures. And where are they? Okay, here's one. One of the things that we're going to teach folks um, is that they don't want to flex their hips more than 90 degrees, um, <clears throat> such as this lady is doing here. Let me kind of point her out. Um, you don't want to bend from a standing position, and you don't want to squat down. Um, do not bend your hip more than 90 degrees. Another thing that we're going to tell them not to do, let's see if I can find another color there. Don't cross your legs. Um... This is another thing that can just pop that hip right out, okay? Um, so don't do that. Get rid of that. Um, and the other thing that we don't want them to do is this um, turning that affected leg inward, like that pigeon-toed position, and that will just, especially in a non-cemented um, joint, that can just pop that right out. So let me get rid of that. But these are some instructions we're going to give to patients. We're certainly going to abide by them while they're inpatient. Um, do I have some more? I do. Right here. And this is a great big picture, so I'll blow it up just a little bit more, cover up my chalkboard. Okay, so they can flex that hip 90 degrees. That's it. That's all they can do. Um, they should not raise it past 90 degrees. And that's, that's okay, that's not. Um, don't bend too far when you're standing. We just kind of talked about that. But this is where, you know, people are in bed. Um, they need to know, yeah, you have to have those pillows um, between your knees so that the leg stays nice, um, nice and aligned um, and it does not adduct. Because here you have that leg is kind of turning inward um, and adducting. And that's going to um, sort of get that prosthesis, make it more likely to be dislocated. Okay. And then here, again, we've got that um, crossing of the legs, rolling the legs inward. That's a no. Um, we don't want to have the patient do any of that. And so certainly when you're positioning the patient in bed, when you're turning them, when you're um, making the bed, when you're getting them, you know, Situated, you want to keep them keep turning them every two hours because we don't want skin breakdown. This is um, a population that's having trouble with mobility. Um, you know, you just want to make sure that when you're turning them and everything, you have that abductor pillow and that you have some help. Maybe you want to log roll that person a little bit so that you don't put any stress on the joint. Um, but prevention of dislocation of the prosthesis, you're going to teach this patient to do those things for four months postoperatively. And when they're in the hospital, you're definitely going to use that abductor pillow. Um, and let PT help you um, with that first early ambulation. I know on 2A, they're really good about getting people um, up and moving and doing it safely. Uh, yeah, everything wants to kind of clump together. Okay, so one of our other goals is going to be to prevent infection. And you remember our talk about osteomyelitis and how difficult it is to treat and how um, a septic joint can become a vascular necrosis. And we don't want any of those complications to happen to our patients. So obviously we're going to make sure that we administer our antibiotics on time. Um, we're going to do a septic technique with dressing changes and um, with any wound care that we do. And um, we might encourage people who aren't feeling well to avoid visiting um, or wearing a mask. They can wear a mask when they're there. Um, so that's really preventing infection. You also teach your patient when they go home. I mean, every post-op patient should know um, how to promote healing through their diet. If they're diabetic, obviously you're going to control their blood sugars um, and maintain their diabetic diet. If they are, um, you know, maybe on the undernourished side, you're going to try and um, get them to increase their intake of protein, vitamin A, vitamin C. Um, vitamin K helps normal blood clotting. Um, so those are some kind of things that you might want to help with that person with. Treating pain. Um, okay, so after a joint replacement, um, a lot of times these people have less pain, like after a few days, um, because they're 
disease joint is now gone and they've got um, a prosthesis that works. However, the first couple of days post-op, they may have significant pain. And those of you who have seen um, procedures when you've done your OR rotation where they hammer the joint and they use Black & Decker drills and they have special tools, they're really kind of rough on those bones and on those joints. Um, so you definitely want to take their pain seriously and you want to treat it appropriately. This is where a lot of times you'll see opioid narcotics and you might see them scheduled um, as opposed to PRN. Um, so the patient doesn't have to remember to ask for it. You might also see um, PCA or patient controlled analgesia where they push the button and they get um, pain relief. Monitoring drainage. Um, usually by the time they get back from the OR, they are, um, they have good hemostasis. Um, but you're going to want to make sure that when you check your dressings, they're clean, dry, and intact. If the dressing has been removed and their incision is open to air, you're going to monitor the um, color, odor, consistency, and amount of drainage and look for excessive drainage. Um, if they have a wound vac or a hemovac or anything like that, you're going to look at the drainage in the um, drain and measure that. And last but not least, your five P's again, in case there was any um, neurological nerve damage or any vascular compromise, you're going to look at pain, paresthesia, paralysis, um, pallor and pulselessness. Um, and this is where you might have to compare one extremity to the other because somebody who has a hip replacement, um, if you're noticing that you have to get the Doppler to get their peripheral pulses, you might want to check the other side and make sure it's not just something that was unique to them. Um, but if it's a new finding, um, if they are all of a sudden talking about burning and tingling, um, it's definitely worth reporting. And pain in the joint would be normal, but if you're having um, that pain sort of more referred down distally, you might want to get that checked out as well. A big part of our job as um, nurses, especially in the acute care setting, is going to be planning for um, independence in the home or um, a rehab stay. So we have to do a lot of fast and furious planning and teaching with people um, because they need to have all this important information by the time they, they leave the hospital, and that's usually about day two. Um, rarely does it extend to day three, um, but we want to make sure that they understand their HIP precautions. Um, and that they understand their weight-bearing um, limitations. Um, if they have assistive devices such as walkers, um, we want to make sure that they show that they're um, capable of using them. We want to make sure that they have an environment that where they don't have to climb stairs until they're ready um, and that they should have some help at home. Um, they might need an orthopedic chair or a raised toilet seat. And again, that is going to be to avoid unnecessary flexion. You always want their hips higher than their knees, never the opposite. Um, and that's going to keep them from dislocating that prosthesis. We're also going to teach them the signs and symptoms of a dislocation. Um, and we might see those in the hospital as well. So it's sort of important to know them. And I'm going to put some down here. Hold on one sec. Okay, um, so signs and symptoms of dislocation would be sudden acute pain, um, a pop, or a feeling of sudden give. Um, usually, the affected leg appears shorter. Um, and it may be abnormally rotated. Now your book says both internally and ex inter either internally or externally, but um, the pictures that I saw were all internally, and none of them were really suitable for posting um, here. But if you look yourself, um, you may see some images. They were copyrighted, and I didn't have time to really obtain permission. Um, so but you can feel free to um, look at them yourselves. Um, so you should know really the signs and symptoms of a dislocation. On x-ray, you'll actually see that um, ball out of the socket joint. Um, and this is very painful. And like I said, this is, um, becomes problematic. 
uh, you may need to revise now what you've done, go back in and fix um, or reduce that dislocation. So we want to prevent it, really. Um, send people home with those abductor pillows and make sure that they have enough education. Okay, so this is the last section of Unit 8, Total Knee Arthroplasty, and it's pretty similar to Total Hip, so maybe we can um, get through it a little bit quickly um, and still give it all the coverage that it needs. The pre-op care is basically the same as for the Total Hip. Um, as far as timing the surgery, as far as antibiotic protocol, as far as showering with the special wipes, maintaining NPO status, um, site marking should occur really on any procedure that has any laterality to it. If there's a left or right side and there's a possibility that you could replace the wrong joint, um, the site should be marked. It is common, even in people who have pain in both knees, to replace one at a time only because it makes ambulation so much easier if you have one strong leg. Um, so um, site marking does become important there. Um, same anesthesia considerations intraoperatively. You can have an epidural, you can have a spinal, you can have general. Um, and there's nothing different about the spinal or epidural you would get with a knee arthroplasty um, that you didn't learn in perioperative care. Um, just know that some agents that they give through the epidural or spinal, and I didn't mention this for the hip, but it is still true. Um, some of the agents that they use, um, such as Duramorph, provide long-lasting pain relief. And this is a definite advantage when you're trying to control post-operative pain, when you're trying to get patients out of bed, um, when you're trying to get them to um, cooperate with their plan of care. So if they can get an agent through the spinal like Duramorph, um, that gives them excellent pain relief for the first 24 hours. That's great. Um, also with a knee surgery, um, when I'm reading perioperative or preoperative and intraoperative reports, um, the procedural reports from the physician, um, a lot of them are reporting the use of some kind of tourniquet, um, usually an inflatable tourniquet, to prevent excessive blood loss because knee surgery can be a fairly bloody surgery. Um, and then cell saver technology is... Uh, pretty popular as well. Okay, so post-op care of total knee replacement um, focuses on a few things. Mostly we're looking at pain control. Knee surgery can be pretty painful. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're assessing pain regularly um, and that we're treating it seriously. We're going to give opioid narcotics most times, sometimes some NSAIDs um, for breakthrough pain or acetaminophen. Um, for pain that's not controlled by narcotics. Um, we're going to give ice to reduce swelling and pain, and I have seen the cryo cuff, which is sort of a, um, it's connected to a little bucket of ice water, and it runs cold water through um, the device to provide cold therapy. Um, that'll help with the edema as well. Now I put CPM, that stands for Continuous Passive Motion Machine. Um, the evidence is really conflicting about it. Uh, it's really fallen out of favor. There are some docs that still use continuous passive motion. Let me give you a picture so you know what I'm talking about. Let me give you sort of a frame of reference here. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. There's the continuous passive motion. These were really popular back when I was a new nurse. Um, it goes on this little track and it just kind of goes back and forth. You know, right this way and that way and it would be on all the time and give that person just like the name implies continuous passive range of motion um it was not the most comfortable machine to use to be perfectly honest here let me get rid of that too sorry oh got rid of the wrong thing hold on that is what i wanted to get rid of okay um it was not the most comfortable thing for patients to have that continuous passive motion going on. And the other thing that um, it was really of no proven benefit um, in the, the systematic reviews and um, actually increased swelling according to several studies. So continuous passive motion is sort of something I don't see very often um, in OB, definitely don't see it ever. Um, but even on the floors, really have not seen the continuous passive motion machine. Um, DVT prophylaxis, let's see if I can get a star next to that, just so that you, like I said, if you're getting bored, that's fine. If orthopedics and DVT are like spaghetti meatballs, that's okay. 
um, you want to remember it is you're always going to make sure you have those SCDs. Obviously with a knee surgery, you're going to have the SCD on the unaffected leg. Um, you're going to make sure that you um, are assessing for a DBT. If there's an order for Lovenox or heparin, you're going to give it. If not, you're going to get one. Um, frequently, these patients can't even go home until their coags are normal because they're at such high risk for a DBT. Um, and I think I said it before that Joint Commission has made a venous thromboembolic event a never event with elective surgery. Um, Early ambulation is important both for DVT prophylaxis and also for the recovery of the knee. So it's very typical, and another star I think is in order. Um, if a patient were to ask you, like, what should I expect after knee surgery, you would tell them, you should be out of bed 24 hours after your surgery. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to be fully weight-bearing. They'll probably um, have to, you'll have to defer to the surgeon's instructions, but they're probably going to need some type of assistive device. And um, they may not be ready for stairs for a week or two. But by six weeks, they should really be fully recovered. Um, and early ambulation is the key to that. Um, PT is usually involved. They usually have follow-up with physical therapy. Um, you know, for that first six weeks post-operatively. Um, now, knee immobilizers are something else you typically see. Hold on one second. I'll see if I can find a picture of that. Okay, so that's a picture of a knee immobilizer, and these are commonly seen after surgery. Um, one thing that you want to make sure that you're not going to flex that knee. Um, don't put it. Don't elevate it on a pillow so that the knee is bent. Um, you're you are worrying about flexion contractures similar to the amputated patient. Um, you don't want that knee to remain flexed, um, and of course you're going to monitor your incision. Um, you're going to look for bleeding if there is a drain or a wound vac. You're going to assess the drainage from that um, and be ready to report anything that's excessive. You're going to look for signs and symptoms of infection. And you're going to monitor your five Ps again, the neurovascular status. And for me, the knee surgery is the one where you're likely to see some of that um, because they do have that interruption in circulation while the surgery is taking place when they have that um, inflatable tourniquet. Or it's like a big blood pressure cuff where they really sort of um, prevent a massive hemorrhage from occurring on the OR table, but they've also got that um, pressure on those big vessels for, you know, many minutes. Um, there is always the potential for some neurovascular compromise. So again, your five Ps, you're always checking. Um, and that's your post-op care for total knee. Okay, so just to finish up, we're almost done with the uh, unit. Um, and I just want to talk about some nursing diagnosis that we might use for total hip and total knee replacement. And obviously the first thing we're going to talk about is pain. Um, another issue that we want to talk about here, where can I find a spot for this? Well, let me see if I get rid of this. Hold on. And this. And maybe I'll just shrink that and put it over here. Post-up care is pretty important. I don't want to maybe remove that all the way. So nursing diagnosis. Um, we talk about pain um, with both procedures. Um, we talk about impaired skin integrity because you have an incision. And we talk about risk for infection. Impaired mobility. I mean, those would be your major ones. Certainly you have collaborative diagnosis. And this person is at risk for bleeding. We'll say potential complica complications too. Um, bleeding um, at risk for dislocation. 
um, and then we talk about um, DVT, PE, um, oops, sorry, added something that shouldn't be there, but all those collaborative diagnoses and all the um, post-op complications that a patient can get that we're going to worry about. Um, but the basis of your care plan is really going to be, let me fix that, um, pain, impaired skin integrity, risk for infection, impaired mobility, and then your collaborative diagnoses. Um, and certainly, you're going to assess your patient and whatever individual factors you find um, if that patient has a self-care deficit because they live alone. Um, impaired Risk for impaired home maintenance is another one. That's sort of a newer one. Um, you're going to look up that. If they have complications with... Um, maybe taking those deep breaths with the incentive spirometer, you might have ineffective breathing pattern. Um, but uh, those would be the things that you look at. So when we um, wrap this up, uh, we'll see each other in the classroom on Tuesday. Um, and if you bring your questions for the entire unit, I think there's going to be plenty of time to um, review Unit 8 and go over some things. And um, hopefully we can get... Um, a pretty good summary going on um, so that you have some guidance and direction for uh, for your upcoming exams and also um, you want to just have a good firm basis of knowledge because you are going to see a lot of patients with musculoskeletal disorders if you stay in acute care nursing med surge nursing so thanks for sticking with it I really appreciate all the patience and all the effort you guys put into this so um, thanks and we'll talk Tuesday bye